All right, thank you for coming and welcome to Martha Guy. Um, these all sort of stemmed from what I was seeing in the paddock. So we were realising that, you know, um, it was getting terribly dry and that people were really running into trouble with feeding. So today is really informal. Lots of questions interrupt me. Put, you don't even have to put your hand up, just yell out. And um, hopefully it's relevant to what you're doing on your place. Basically today focuses on the very basics of feeding, what's happening inside the rumen, and if we can understand what's happening inside the rumen, we can put the best stuff in and make our rumens you know, work to the, not only the benefit of our pockets, so we want the best value for money, and you know, we just don't, if, we, if things go wrong in our rumens, um, we, you know, that's, when, that's when I get called out to the dead stock or, or the sick stock. So, this is a rumen. And of course, sheep and cattle are ruminants and they've got four stomachs. But today we're going to just ignore three of them and we're just going to focus on um, the rumen because this really is the powerhouse of a sheep or a cow. Um, this is where the fermentation happens. And them developing a rumen over millions of years really is the defining thing between them and us. It's the reason why they can live on poor quality roughages and, um, and make use of that feed and turn it into something usable. So lamb or beef or milk or you know, growing a fetus and all those sorts of things. So inside the rumen, the important little fellas in here are these rumen bugs, rumen microbes. And there's billions and billions and billions of them. And I'm getting called out to a lot of dead stock and a lot of sick stock. And whenever I do a post-mortem, particularly in a drought situation, I always have a really good look in their rumen. And that's usually where you'll find what's gone wrong. Um, I always do a rumen pH because rumen pH will tell you a lot about the health of the rumen, especially when we're grain feeding. And I also take a sample of this fluid and I put it under the microscope and in a normal room, and you don't have to magnify it too much, but you'll see bugs swimming. So they're really active. There's billions and billions of them and they're all really active and really swimming. But what we're finding at the moment with a lot of people who have just got their feeding rations wrong or they're not feeding enough is that um, these um, bugs are starting to die. So yes, if we can keep these guys happy, we're going to have a happy functioning animal. So... When we, talk, when we start to talk um, about rumen function, there's sort of two important concepts and it's a little bit hard to get your head around. But these rumen microbes, they need energy and they need protein to run their own little motors. And then it's their job to break down energy and protein to build, whether it's beef or whether it's lamb or whether it's milk or a fetus, okay? So then they will make use of energy and protein. So if we just energy and protein. So if we just say, for example, look at energy, and the reason I always start with energy is that energy is the most important driver when we're drought feeding. So when I get a lot of calls from people who are interested in, you know, getting their rations right or looking at um, what are we going to feed these animals, they get really tangled up on protein and they tell me what the protein of the hay is or they tell me what the protein of the feed is. When we're drought feeding animals for survival, and we're feeding adult animals, so adult cows, adult, um, adult sheep, energy is our main driver. When we're feeding things that are growing, so weaners or um, we're trying to get animals to grow and lay down muscle tissue, protein will become more important. But by and large, when we're feeding our adult animals, energy is what we need to supply. Energy is the most important, energy's on top, then protein, then fibre, then some vitamins and minerals. So that's our levels of importance. So yeah, energy is king. So we'll give energy a little crown. So energy's on top, energy's the one that's the most important. So if we talk about a molecule of energy coming into the rumen, there's energy in everything. There's lots of energy in cereal grains, there's energy in haze, there's energy in you know, our pulse grains. Everything we feed's got energy in it. And when we look at energy, it's really just carbohydrates. So if you remember back to chemistry at school, it's just really fancy chains of C's and H's and O's all strung together. So when we eat energy, if we go and have one of Corrine's delicious sandwiches, um, when we break down that um, carbohydrate, we've got a very simple stomach. And so um, there's a very simple process for turning carbohydrates into blood glucose. But because these guys are ruminants, there's an extra step. So these, when the carbohydrate comes into the rumen, it becomes a volatile fatty acid. We've all heard of them? 
Yep. And you don't have to remember what the three types of volatile fatty acids are called, but there's three types. There's propionate, butyrate, and acetate. And you don't have to remember their names, but what is important is, is that propionate is the biggest driver of blood glucose. It produces 70% of the body's blood glucose. And of course, particularly at the moment, anyone who's got a calving cow or a lambing ewe knows that that drive for glucose in those animals is massive, isn't it? Like we have trouble getting enough carbohydrate into them to keep them alive. Because those fetuses inside that animal will just suck glucose, won't they? Um, we've all probably seen pregnancy toxemia, particularly in sheep, in twin bearing ewes, because those fetuses will just suck glucose and suck glucose and suck glucose to the detriment of the animal. You know, if we don't provide it, if she can't get it into herself, she'll die as a result of that. So glucose is really important. So if we were designing a ration, if we, were, if we had an open checkbook and we had all of the grains you know, laid out and we could buy anything, we would want to design our ration to produce lots of propionate. And the best way to do that is with starch. So you've all got the little photocopied handout there in front of you. And it's a, just a really good table. I'd stick this one up in your office on your pin board or on your filing cabinet or something like that. Um, because not only does it tell you the energy and the protein content of the, the main grains, and there's a, there's a lot more detailed tables or a lot more extensive tables in the back of your managing drought book, but it will tell you the starch content and the oil content, okay? Now, just moving quickly on to oil, who is feeding cottonseed? Yeah, we're so lucky to have it locally available here, aren't we? So, oil is another way of getting energy into animals. It's very energy dense. So, for one carbohydrate molecule, oil's got about two and a half times the energy density. So, it's, it's, very, it's a very good way of feeding animals. But the oil um, content will ruin rumen bugs if it's in too high an amount. So as a general rule, we say that rumen bugs can only tolerate about 6% oil in their diet. Now on that chart, it'll tell you that cotton seeds about, is it say 21% oil? Yep. Yeah. So we've tested some, we've tested the um, latest cotton seed um, samples and they range from 12 to 16% oil. So it's a bit less than what we historically thought but it still means that they can't live on cottonseed. There's, there's still more than 6% oil in it. And so we can't rely on that to supply um, their energy needs. We need to put other stuff with it. Ruminants seem to have this innate ability to know, you know when the oil content of their diet is, is too much. So if you put it out in the paddock, they seem to not self-regulate initially. So if you put it out, they'll guts into it. So if you're gonna feed cottonseed, I usually say, put it out the first week, don't just dump it out, put it out and feed them every second day and get them onto it and then you can dump it out less frequently. Um, and they, yeah, they seem to self-limit. So the rough rule is, um, you know, no more than about four kilos a head per day for cattle and no more than about 400 grams per day for sheep. So what actually happens with this oil, if this, let's say this is a piece of hay. Hay, particularly the hays we're seeing at the moment are very fibrous. So they're pretty poor quality, they've been harvested quite late. And they've got a lot of lignin and cellulose and hemicellulose bonds in there. So when a piece of hay comes into the rumen, these little rumen microbes, it's their job to attach and to chew. And they actually excrete little enzymes and they bite into the hay and they do their thing. Now when we put oil into the rumen, the oil coats the hay and makes it quite slimy. And the polyunsaturated fatty acids in the oils are actually toxic to rumen microbes. So you get two things happening. You've got slimy hay so that the, the microbes can't attach. And then you've got actual microbe death as well. So just be careful any more than 6% is an issue. Now you will get some varieties of oats that have got high oil contents. Um, so yes, if you're feeding oats it might not, and, and cottonseed together, that might, you might really need to look at your oil content of your oats. And has, is anybody here feeding grape mark? Grape mark is a byproduct of the winemaking process. It's grape skins and grape seeds. And of course, grape seeds are full of grape seed oil. So that can be an issue if you're feeding cotton seed and grape mark together. The oil content can, can just wreak a bit of havoc. So just watch that as well. So the next thing that's really important 
is protein. So as I said, everyone, a lot of people get really tangled up with protein. They think it's more important than it is. It is important, but not as important as energy for drought feeding. So when we feed something that's got protein in it, and of course there's protein in everything, cereal grains, pulse grains, haze, you know, there's protein in everything. When it comes in, the rumen microbes, they break it down. So it'll be proteins or peptides or amino acids. The rumen microbes will work on it and will break it down into its base form. Um, and remember how we said that energy is link, link chains of C's and H's and O's. Um, protein is just, there's a lot of N in it. There's some C's and some H's and some O's as well, but by and large, we're feeding protein to get the N out of it. And that's sort of why we can trick the rumen with a bit of urea. So urea is a non-protein nitrogen source, but it's just bucket loads of N. That's why it's so toxic and you know, we can only feed little bits of it. But we're, we're basically, we're looking at the urea because we want the N out of it. So when a protein molecule comes in, or pro like let's say they eat a, a lupin, these little microbes go to town on it very quickly and the N levels rise really quickly. So within about half an hour of being eaten, the ammonia levels in the rumen are at their peak. So it's a very quick process. And this ammonia is really handy because in the right amount, these guys just love it because they're made of protein. So they take that ammonia and they build it into themselves and they use it to have a really healthy working colony. So the more, you know, if, if everything's firing in here and we've got a nice bit of carbohydrate and a nice bit of N, these microbes are doing their thing. They're reproducing and they're living and they're dying and they're reproducing and they're working and they're, they're great. The problem is, is when we get too much N. So if we get really high levels of um, protein, some of it will spill across the rumen wall and into the bloodstream. And too much ammonia in the bloodstream is toxic. It's the liver's job to get rid of it. So the liver has to work on it and turn it back into urea to be excreted by the kidneys as urine. So if we're feeding a diet that's super high in protein and very mismatched to our energy quantity, we're gonna get a lot of free floating nitrogen or ammonia in the bloodstream. Now, in high quantities, that'll kill your animals. So every, a lot of people you know, believe lupins are safe and faba beans are safe. Every year I see dead animals on lupins or faba beans because they're allowed way too much of them and they just guts themselves and they, they die of ammonia poisoning. If it's not in a toxic level that causes death, the free-floating ammonia still puts heaps of pressure on this liver. And this liver doesn't run on air, this liver runs on energy. So we've just talked about how important energy is and how important glucose production is. What we're doing when we're feeding high amounts of protein is we're asking this liver to work overtime and that's actually sucking a bit of this very important energy into this liver to drive it. So it's a bit counterintuitive for what we're trying to achieve. So if you have a look in your managing drought book that, I've, um, that I gave you, it's considered the Bible. Like it's, um, it's such a great book. There's a little table on page 40 and it teaches you about the energy and the protein matching of the diet. So if we're feeding this much energy, we want this much protein. This is an ideal situation. We're in a drought and things aren't ideal. So we're making do with what we've got. But if you're designing a ration, if you're thinking I might feed cottonseed and hay or I might feed barley and cottonseed and hay or whatever, that's a really good table to refer to. The other really good thing to refer to is your phone. Um, I'm sure you've all got an iPhone, um, or lots of you hopefully, or you know someone with an iPhone or an Android, but basically a smartphone. You can go into the app store and you can download the drought feeding calculator. If you just type in DPI drought, it will come up. Um, it's free. You only need service to download it. After that, you can use it with no service. But it will allow you to plug in different types of feeds and then different types of animals and create a mix and fiddle with the amounts and things like that to, to feed your animals. It'll actually alert you if you're doing the wrong thing. It'll say, nope, the energy's not high enough or nope, you know, this is not going to work. 
And the other thing is it costs it out. So it'll tell you how much grain you're gonna to need to feed those animals for a, set, for a period that you define. And it will also um, tell you um, what it's gonna cost per day and what it's gonna cost for the period and how much grain you need per day or how you need per day and how much you need for a set period. So that's fantastic. But you still need to know a little bit about ruminant nutrition to use it. And so that table on page 40 will come in really handy just for matching your energy and your protein. And um, I mean, it's, as I said, that's ideal. Don't panic if it doesn't match exactly, but just use it as a little bit of a guide. So in terms of protein, for adult animals that aren't growing and that aren't laying down muscle and, and growing skeletally, they'll get away with you know, six or 7% protein. So six is sort of a bit of a magic number. We want them to have 6% protein. Um, if we are feeding weaners and, and growing animals, um, then we need more protein, much more protein, and the protein will become important. When we feed any sort of protein, doesn't matter if it's loosen hay or lupin or whatever, um, leaving aside urea for a minute, a portion of that protein is going to be broken down in the rumen, and that's called rumen degradable protein. And then a portion is going to escape the rumen and end up as bypass protein. We've all heard of bypass protein? Yep. So a lot of people too get really tangled up on bypass protein. For an adult animal that's, you know, calving cow, lambing ewe, the amount of bypass protein is not super important either. It is very important for growing animals. So if we're going to be early weaning, yes, we want some bypass protein in their diet. With your grains and your haze, the percentage of what's broken down in here versus what escapes and ends up here will differ. So, for example, your cotton seed will be 70% broken down in here and 30% will escape. So in, in nearly every real feed, you're going to get some that ends up as bypass anyway. If you're really chasing bypass protein, like, so if you're going to early wean, like lambs or little calves, your protein meals are where you get a lot of bypass protein from. And they've been heat treated so that they escape the room and end up here as bypass protein. Cottonseed meal or canola meal or copra meal or those sorts of things. There's a few different ones. And they're very potent. So you, do, you can feed a small amount. You get a lot of bang for your buck. So, you know, they are expensive to buy, but they escape the room and end up here. So that's the point of them. And in your managing drought book, there's some good, um, you know, particularly for those early weaners, there's some good recipes on, you know, protein meals and what to feed and those sorts of things. But, but that's the point of the protein meals. If we've got a diet that's less than 6% protein, um, that's when we might want to put some urea into the system to boost it, hey? Yep. And the thing that urea does is it supplies N, it's 100% rumen degradable, so none of it ends up down here. So 100% of it ends up in here. It really gives these microbes something to work on. So we can use urea to top up our percentage of protein, and we can also use it to stimulate dry feed consumption. Okay? So if you put some urea in here, especially if you do it with a sugar, so um, like a readily fermentable carbohydrate, you'll stimulate these rumen bugs um, and they'll work harder for you. So they'll eat more dry feed. So that's, that's the beauty of a lot of those supplements. So the next thing I want to talk about briefly is, like, that probably leads on really well to supplements. Who's putting out some sort of a, either a syrup lick or a dry lick or a block for their animals? Yep. Yep. And so I know that you guys understand it because you've been to one of my drought smokers before. Um, but I think a lot of people go and buy a supplement for their stock because they just want to give them something extra. But in my mind, at least, there's three reasons why we should be going and buying one of those products. The first is to supply urea, as we've just spoken about. Um, the key, and, and um, I think that you get more um, improvement on dry feed consumption from urea in cattle than you do from sheep. Um, we just don't seem to see the benefits in sheep from feeding urea. And I think that's because um, 
sheep are very selective grazers. So they go out and they'll find a green shoot or a leaf or something yummy in the paddock to eat. And so essentially what they're doing via their little, their little mouths that do the work and find the shoots, they're injecting the good stuff into this rumen via that process. So us putting in extra doesn't really help. Whereas if you've got a cow, cows graze non-discriminately, they wrap their tongue around and they pull and they get a big heap of dry grass and they don't have the ability to seek out the good stuff. So what we know is for a 450 kilo cow, if we supply her with 50 grams of urea per head per day, you will increase her dry feed consumption by 14 to 26%. And so what we're aiming to do with any of our supplements if we're chasing urea in cattle is we want to supply with 50 grams. So if you're going to go in and buy a supplement for urea, you need to start to have a look at how much urea they're actually getting out of the product that you're buying. Because it will vary between preparations and it will vary between products. Um, but that's something that you really need to, to look at if, and, you know, and work out where is the wisest place to spend your money. Okay. The other thing is that, well, the second reason that we, you know, might be um, feeding a, um, a supplement is to supply energy. And I have people who um, go and buy supplements, energy supplements for lambing use. Just to give you a bit of an idea, this is how much energy animals need. And remember, because we said energy is king. So when we're designing our rations and we're thinking about what we're feeding, we want to know how many megajoules those animals are getting every day. 60 megajoules a day for a dry cow. 80 megajoules a day for a pregnant cow in the last month of her gestation. 8 megajoules for a dry sheep. 13 megajoules for a single bearing ewe in the last four weeks of pregnancy and 18 for a twin bearer. So when we go into the shop and we buy an energy, like in our primary driver for buying that supplement is energy supplementation. I, I worked it out like for a 450 kilo cow the other day and it doesn't matter pretty much whatever supplement you buy, you know, on the market, at best they're going to get a couple of megajoules out of it. So if you're a 450 kilo cow, a couple of megajoules is really not a drop in the ocean, is it? It's a very small amount of energy. So that's not a waste. That, that couple of megajoules is probably in the form of sugar. It's probably a molasses or something like that. Um, or, a, or, you know, a vegetable sugar. Or, it's very readily fermentable. You know, it's really yummy. So these microbes are going to love it. They're going to lap it up and use it to do their thing and to work really hard. So it's great from that point of view. It's very useful for our rumen bugs. But if you think you're going to go and buy a supplement to supply any amount of really, you know, um, valuable energy that's of any significant impact, you're kidding yourself. Unfortunately, you can't go and buy a product that is going to, um, you know, um, get away from either having decent pasture or haze, grains, you know, those sorts of um, supplements, those sorts of full feeds. A cow with a calf, it's, they need an extra five megajoules of energy per one litre of milk. And so, I, I, like a, a little calf will probably drink, you know, four or five litres a day. So that cow with a calf at foot, she, the minute she calves, she comes back to being a 60 megajoule cow on her own but she's producing four or five litres of milk so she needs another so yeah yep and that's why I mean so if you're a, a cow that's heavily in calf and you've got a big wiener sucking on you that's why you know the big wieners hold them back so much because it's 80 megajoules then with some milk on top we know that um, at the moment even if we were deficient in something our animals are largely living at a, out of our feed carts at the moment they're not really grazing from the paddocks anyway and what we know with any of our drought feeding rations is that they're all high in phosphorus and they're low in calcium. Cereal grains, you know, they're all very high in phosphorus and very low in calcium. And when we're, an animal's diet really should be the other way around. They should have double the amount of calcium roughly, 
to the level of phosphorus. So we need to add calcium into the system to correct that. So whenever you're drought feeding, you should be feeding some form of calcium, whether that's lime or whether it's a commercial product with calcium in it, whatever, as you said, suits your country and what, you know, that you can get um, animals to eat. But the salt's really important as well. So in the room and wall, there's a ATP driven sodium and potassium pump. And so you remember from chemistry long, long time ago that sodium is Na and potassium is K. Yep. So one sodium in one potassium out, one sodium in one potassium out. It's this little pump. And when we're, a lot of the times when we're drought feeding, our rations are also high in potassium. And this is particularly an issue, I hate to talk about the future, or hope that we get green feed soon, but when we get green feed or crop, those sorts of paddocks are particularly high in potassium. So if we're drought feeding, or if we go into a period where we've got green feed, our pump starts to struggle a bit because it becomes very imbalanced. So we get a lot of potassium, not very much sodium, and our pump struggles and shuts down. This pump is where our macro minerals piggyback on. So this is how calcium and magnesium gets absorbed across the room and wall is via this pump. They piggyback on. So if you've got an imbalanced pump that's shut down, it doesn't matter how much calcium and how much magnesium you put in that rumen, it's, the absorption is going to be diminished. And so it's very difficult to take potassium out of a ration or, or out of the green feed. So the easiest way to fix this problem is just to balance it. So put some sodium in. And of course, salt is just sodium chloride. 50% lime, 50% salt, mix it 50-50, put it out you know, 20 metres from the watering points in just to cut off 44 or even a shuttle. If you, you can cut little windows and if you do a shuttle, it gives you a roof so it doesn't get wet. Yeah. If it gets wet, it'll just set hard, which um, you can bust it up, but usually you've got to tip it out and start again. But they can't have too much. The other really good thing about salt, what happens when we think about a packet of salt and winning a chips? Does your mouth start to water? Yep. So when someone first taught me about this, I thought, oh God, like a bit of saliva, how important could that be, really? But a cow produces 100 litres of saliva a day. So she, by that saliva, she is putting a whole lot of sodium bicarbonate, because that's a big um, ingredient in saliva. She's putting a whole lot of that into her rumen. And sodium bicarbonate, not only does it have sodium in it, so we're fixing our pump up a bit, but um, it's a... It's a um, it's basic, so it neutralizes acid. And so if you're feeding grain, great. We wanted to salivate a lot, put a lot of bicarb into that rumen to help produce a more neutral rumen environment. So yeah, salt's very important for a number of reasons. We're just gonna talk a little bit about hay quality because this is something that I sort of picked up the hard way. I just don't think you can tell. And so if you can do a feed test, that's the go. So to do a feed test, and I, a lot of people say, well, by the time we get the feed test back in a week, that truck's gone and then we're on to the next truckload of hay. So that can be a bit of a, a barrier to doing it. But um, you can get one of these feed test bags, they're free. You just you fill the bag up to the appropriate line, depending on whether it's grain or silage or hay. And then you send it off. In a week, you'll get a result back. And, um, and it costs you about $70. And we're just going to have a little talk about how to interpret the feed test when you get it back and how to determine the value of the feed. Um, you've all got your little handouts in front of you, the little photocopied book. The average hay data for the 2017 growing season in New South Wales. So that can be really useful if you're ringing up about hay and you've never heard of vetch hay or you've never heard of canola hay or, or whatever. But be warned is that the average is the average and it bears no bearing on reality at the moment so the hay that we're seeing at the moment is either it can be quite good or it can be quite bad and it varies wildly so take the average with a very big grain of salt and the other thing is there's two oat and hay feed tests in there there's one that looks really fancy and then there's one that came from the dpi lab that's more simply it's simpler to understand so we're going to start off with the simple one yeah just i thought that might be relevant to people out here for what they're feeding can somebody tell me how much do they think an animal eats every day? So the general rule is 3% of body weight. How much will they physically eat? If you laid it on for them, how much would they eat? 
and the rough rule is 3% of body weight. So if I'm a 450 kilo cow, which I'm not, but if I'm a 450 kilo cow and I'm going to eat 3% of my body weight, that means, because I've done this in the last 34 smokers, they're going to eat 13 and a half kilos. Oops, 13 and a half kilos, okay. There's a few things that are going to vary that, isn't there? So palatability is one and taste and how much they like it. But with cows, the biggest thing that's going to vary it is fibre content. If it tastes like old boots and it takes a long time to chew and it, it's all like strawy, they're not going to eat as much as if it's beautiful, you know, lush crop or loosen or, you know, something like that. So the fibre content is going to dictate intake in ruminants a lot. So this is how we interpret a feed test. And it looks complicated, but there's only really four things that you've got to remember. The f well, the first thing to do is put a big old line down that LOR column because that's, it's the limit of reporting column and it just basically tells you how accurate the test result is and how low they can measure and it's something they have to put on there because they're an accredited lab. It just gets in the way and confuses everybody. So we'll just put a line through that. The first thing to look at is the very top line, which is the dry matter. Now, when we look at haze and when we look at grains, they're all going to be roughly 90% dry matter, aren't they? Because they're dry, there's not much water in them. But what we can tell from this particular hay, it's 96 and a half. That's pretty dry, isn't it? So it was probably cut pretty late, we can assume from that, or we can speculate from that. It was probably cut pretty late, not a lot of moisture in it. So the next column is moisture. So together they should equal 100%. If it's not dry, it's moisture. Now, what I, the reason I want you to always look at that is because if we're going to go and buy something weird or something different, like silage or grape mark or um, a byproduct of some description, it might be 50% water. So a lot of the grape marks that are coming out of the wineries at the moment are 50% water. So they're not so cheap when you start to cart half a road train of water across the state. So just bear that in mind. Try and get a feed test first and have a look at the dry matter content. It means that you're going to have to feed out twice as much too, you know. If, you, if you've got two things that are the same feed quality but one's 50% water, if you feed five kilos of the dry one, you're going to have to feed 10 kilos of the wet one. So it, the water content reduces, it, it can impact the, um, you know, the feed value. The second thing to look for is the metabolizable energy. Because remember we said energy is king. I rubbed that off, but energy is king. Um, so in this case, it's 6.4. And we're going to use that value to have a, um, a little bit more of a play with the numbers in a sec. The third thing to look at is the crude protein, which is about halfway down. So what's the crude protein in this hay? Yeah, what did we say was conducive with life? Six. Six is the magic number, so pretty low, hey? Yep, so we probably need to address that. And then finally, the fourth thing, which is what I'm going to talk most about now, is the neutral detergent fibre, or the NDF, which is the third box down. Can everyone see that? And in this case, it's 71. Okay. So the higher the NDF, the more fibre is in the feed. And another way of looking at it is whatever she eats today, 71% of it is still going to be in her room and this time tomorrow. So it's, got a, it's very hard to break down. It's very fibrous. It takes these room and bugs a long time to do their job on it. And it's still going to be sitting there tomorrow waiting to be processed. Okay. If we looked at, say, a lush oats crop, a lush green oats crop, the NDF of that might be 30. What's that mean? What do cows do on oats crops? Yeah, they poo a lot, don't they? Really sloppy poo. So that, that NDF is low. Not much of that's still going to be in the room and this time tomorrow. It's going to have shot through. Yep. So they're going to eat more, aren't they? They're going to be hungry and eat more. Yep. So there's a very simple calculation just to, to better firm up how much they're going to eat. So intake equals body weight of the animal times 1.2 divided by the NDF. So if we're a 450 kilo cow, 
times 1.2 divided by, what was it, 71? We're going to eat 7.6 kilos of hay a day, which is pretty bloody different to this, isn't it? Now, remember how we said energy's king. How many megajoules is this cow, if she's just eating this hay, how much, how much megajoules is she getting? So remember that ME is 6.4. So if we go 7.6 kilos times 6.4 megajoules equals 49. So this oat and hay, it's not really enough for our dry cow. It's certainly not enough for our pregnant cow, is it? So, what we know is that for every body fat, for every kilo of body fat mobilised, it'll release 28 megajoules of energy, okay? So, for simplicity's sake, because I'm not terribly good at maths, let's say it releases 30 megajoules of energy. So, this cow, she needs 60, she's roughly getting 50, so she's got to find 10 herself. So she's going to strip some fat off her back to meet that demand. So if one kilo releases 30 megajoules and she needs 10, she's going to be losing a third of a kilo a day. So there's 80 kilos in one fat score in a cow. So it's going to take her 240 days to slip a fat score, which means that you're not going to be noticing. You're not going to because you see her every day, you're not going to notice that too much until it's probably too late and it's hard to put back on then. This pregnant cow, if she's just eating this hay, she's got to find 30 megajoules a day. So she's going to be losing a whole kilo every day. So she's going to slip a fat score in 80 days. So for this hay, what we could do, if these are dry cows, we could give her 50 grams of urea, couldn't we? Because remember, the protein was less than six, so we could go, oh, we need to add some protein. We'll add in a lick that's got a bit of sugar in it and a bit of urea in it. We'll stimulate these rumen bugs and she'll eat 14 to 26% more. So she'll get 14 to 26% more megajoules out of it. So that would probably bring that dry cow up to 60 megajoules and sustain her. So we could do it that way. The other thing that we could do is say, well, hay is so hard to get, we can't afford to let any of these cows live on hay. So we're going to feed them only four kilos of hay and then we're going to feed cottonseed or grain or something else with it. And then we can use our drought feeding app to play with that a little bit more. Thanks for coming. Hopefully you've learned a bit or at least one thing maybe, or at least you've had a nice cup of tea with your mates which is just as important.